Thank you all. Our uh, panelists up here are getting to know each other and having fun. So this is going to be probably the most fun part of the day, um, where we're going to grill the experts. So we're going to spend, we're, bit, we're about 15 minutes off schedule. I hope you don't mind staying a few minutes late, rather than chop off our um, expert panel's um, great wisdom. So um, welcome our panelists back. Up with us are Josh uh, Brahm and David B. Wright, our phenomenal keynote speakers. How amazing were they? And then joining them are two rock star pro-life advocates. Um, as you heard a little bit of an intro, to Michelle Hendrickson, who is the Eastern Regional Director for Students for Life of America. Did I get that right? No. Okay, so she serves an area so large on the East Coast that you truly wonder if she ever sleeps. Um, and raises two small children with her wonderful husband. Okay, and is uh, renovating a house. <laughs> there's probably actually more to add to that list, so we'll just And there's, there's a lot more, we can talk. So, and then Heather Sells, we're so excited to have you. CEO of Charles County's own pregnancy care center, the Catherine Foundation. So if you notice, we have four experts up here from four very different aspects of the pro-life movement. Um, so this will be um, unique and fun to hear their perspective on the same questions. All right, this first question is for all the panelists. So in your opinion and from your standpoint, what does the pro-life movement need to do to be more effective? Do you want to just like draw a name out of a hat or start from what? Oh, Heather's ready. Okay. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk from our perspective from the Pregnancy Care Center aspect and what we need to do and what we have put in place is grace upon grace. We, we, we sense that when each woman comes into the door, woman, man, child, whoever, we offer astounding amounts of grace because they're not going to hear a word we say unless we open up our arms with warmth and love and um, let them know that we understand. Most of our advocates have been in their shoes and have been down that path and have had abortions, so therefore they can speak into their lives with that grace. So I'm not saying as a whole we don't offer grace, but I have been in situations where that was not present and that truly is the key to unlock the hearts of the women that are abortion vulnerable. And by grace, I just mean listening and not being so quick to jump in with our opinion. Much of what you were sharing earlier is just to uh, op open arm understand who they are and with compassion present all of the options. That's what we do in our center. We share all of the options so that they can make the informed decision. We empower them to make decisions. So grace and empowerment for women and men in that decision-making process. And also we've changed up the way that we advertise and we've, we're rebranding ourselves with um, the campaign that we're calling Love Life. So we have uh, car magnets that are really sharp looking and uh, the 20 year olds in the back really like them so that's who we're going for. They just say love life with a heart and our shirts that's why I'm a little underdressed here compared to the rest but I wanted to represent we have our love life shirts so just starting a, a, a culture of life promoting a culture of life that isn't so much you know the pro-life verbiage but love life who doesn't love life you know even if you've had an abortion or even if you're pro-choice who doesn't love life and that gets into your mind and brain when you see that everywhere love life love life so we're trying to promote that culture of life here in charles county and even beyond so i want to make sure i'm understanding this controversial claim that you're making are you saying sure. that people are not usually positively impacted by being screamed at is that what you're actually saying right Pretty now? Much, yes. Gosh. You're so smart. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> it's amazing. Like you not only just screamed at, that. but you know, not only just screamed at, but you know, pushing yes. a certain agenda. It is like so. Here's this cool thing. Like so, so sometimes we'll talk about how like people are are expecting a very particular thing from pro-lifers, and it's not usually fair because a lot of times Correct. it's like the most friends element that's on the news, exactly. um, and so they're expecting someone like literally with a bullhorn or something mm -hmm. like that and so what's cool about it, even though that's not usually accurate we get to play good cop bad cop with the caricature of the pro-life movement that's in their heads and so then they are so surprised they're like expecting something so much worse than they probably would usually get but just 
by being nice and listening to people and occasionally having a good argument, like people, like people are so surprised and intrigued. Like they're going to be curious about you. This is real. It's like we have this awesome super advantage that people don't know. So is that your opinion, Josh? That we could be more loving? Yeah, yeah. What, what if we love people more? There you go. Like what yeah. if that would be crazy? Like what, what would happen? Um, if we were like, I, I, like when. When I talk, when people ask me what I do, I, I gave you the answer that I give to people when I suspect that they're atheists. I try to help pro-lifers be less weird. When I'm talking to people that I know are religious, I give them a more, uh, a, a less snarky <laughs> answer. Which, but it's just like, this is our heart. Um, we want to help pro-life people to be more like Jesus. So for us, it's like, what we keep coming back to is, what would it look like if Jesus talked to a pro-choice person? Like, what oh, would his body it. language be like? Nice. Like, what kinds of questions would he ask? What would he not ask? There are questions I don't think he would ask. Um, and what would it sound like when he made arguments that are totally grounded in truth? We're not like holding back from the truth, right. but but are spoken with gentleness and grace and love, like the way that like PRC advocates and, and a lot of sidewalk counselors do. Like that's what I want to see. The like rest like the lay pro life people, the ones that aren't working at awesome PRCs. Um, I want everyone to be able to do that in their one on one conversations. So just trying to get closer to that mark. That's that's our vision. I'm gonna steal part of what you said and kind of branch off of that. So uh, talking about uh, being like Christ, and when I think of that, I think of he was this perfect balance of truth and grace. Mm -hmm. And so we've talked yes. so much about this grace part, and I feel like we all just know the truth, but then to actually go out and say it. And I think some of us in this room like have checked that box off. Yeah, I go out and I talk about this all the time. And some of you still need to explore where that is in your life to go out and talk about it. I um, mean, you are full of grace and you are loving people. And sometimes you let that kind of just, well, I can't talk about this. It's controversial. But who are we missing if we can't talk about something because it's controversial? I mean, you just described my entire job as I am one of controversy on college campuses because you just bring it up at all. We have students who they can't even have a cupcake display without it being controversial. <laughs> and you can't even pull that off without some controversy. Try having a big panel saying, you know, should abortion remain legal? And that's what Josh does a lot of times with students. I think you guys were just at Temple. Um, yeah, so we had, a, we had a group at Temple, but when we were at Davidson, and I'll say this crazy thing that happened that like totally goes with what you're saying. Yes. We did this poll, poll, poll table at a private university. We don't usually do that, but it was a small, beautiful campus in, in Charlotte. And this is a really pretty hostile campus. There's a lot of like backlash from this viral video this conservative group made like a year ago that's still affecting everybody. It's, it's really interesting. But we met up, there's this pro-life student who walks by and he talks to the student club leader. He wants to sign no abortion should remain being legal but he doesn't want to he's like I don't want to put my name on that it's a small campus people might recognize who I am and so the student club leader said just you can just put anonymous like it's not a real poll we're just trying to get people to come to us so we can talk and he's like you just sign anonymous like a bunch of other people did and he says would you sign it for me like I don't want anyone to see me touch that pad like they're so terrified of being like he's an in the closet pro-lifer on this campus um, and that's bad. That's, that's identity politics gone like, to this natural conclusion, I think, um, where people feel so afraid of talking about their own views. We need to try to turn that mm -hmm. around. So I'm going to go a little different direction. Um, what do I think is needed? I think is for each individual, and I alluded to this during my talk earlier, to discern where God can use them to make the greatest impact. And what I'm not talking about is activity. I'm talking about outcomes. So we have had 44 years of abortion, and we've done lots of pro-life stuff. Some of those things have been highly effective. Many of those things have not. Are we willing to look in the mirror and yes. honestly assess those things yes. and say, what works and what doesn't, and let's do more of what's working Let's do less of what's not working or none of that. And the, the reason I say that, I, I was talking about the book, The One Thing, earlier. As you go over and you look at the organizations represented here, and you have some amazing organizations, and I would say these are all the ones that are doing the good stuff that's working. But you have to decide where can God use you to accomplish the greatest good. And I think that's really where you begin to see breakthroughs. I mean, I look at Josh. I knew Josh when he was working at the Right to Life group in Fresno, California. And he ran a 40 Days for Life campaign there. That was when we first met. And Josh was doing good. 
that he was not in that sweet spot of completely fulfilling where God was calling him. And I remember phone conversations we had. I was one day driving through Richmond, and we were on the phone. And he was telling me, I feel that I'm supposed to be doing what is today ERI. And he said, I've had some good intention people tell me, well, you could go work for other groups and do something similar to that for a few years. And I just said, what is God putting on your heart? And I may be paraphrasing this a bit. And he described to me, I feel like I'm supposed to do it. And I'm like, then do it. And here he is. And he's impacting people all across the country and around the world. And I think for each of us, it's difficult because this is challenging. This is controversial. And we look at the what we do sometimes based on what makes me feel comfortable. And we're going to be stretched out of our comfort zones. The reality of this is it's spiritual warfare. And we're going to have to do things that are uncomfortable. But sometimes when we let go and let God, he can begin to work through us in a profound way we would never expect. I am out of my comfort zone far more often than I'm in it in my pro-life work. And I would suspect that he's going to ask the same of you. If he doesn't, I'm going to feel cheated. Feel like it's not so with that, I, I just, and the last thought on impact is, I remember when I quit my job in the pharmaceutical world, and the first week I was on staff of this little pro-life group, the Coalition for Life in College Station, Texas. And we, one of the first things we realized is we felt that we were supposed to get people to come out and pray outside of the abortion center. And so we said, we're going to go all in. We're going to try to get people out there. And my wife invited me to her, uh, it was Young Moms Bible Study at her church, at our church. And so we went to this Bible study, and there were all these moms. The kids were running around screaming the whole time. And so here I am trying to convince these moms to come out and bring their kids and pray outside of the abortion facility. And in the midst of this, I'm telling them, this is what we feel is the most important thing that we can do right now to help save lives, and here's why. And for whatever reason, I said this, and I was like kicking myself for saying it. I said, in fact, if six months from now, at any hour of the day that that Planned Parenthood facility is open, you drive by and there aren't people praying outside, never give us a nickel of financial support. And I was like, why did I just say that? But if we really believed that having people outside of that place was impactful and we had reasonable reason and we had evidence to, to prove that, then we needed to be accountable for those activities and then we need to be accountable for the results. When the abortion numbers are reported at the end of the year, when states that report that, if they're not going down, then we in the pro-life movement have to do a gut level check and say, we've got to change our direction a little bit. We've got to try different things. So it's that level of accountability. As you take your first step or your next step in your pro-life involvement, certainly strive to be in alignment with the Holy Spirit. And if you're not, you'll find that out pretty quickly. And then get engaged where you think you can make the greatest impact with that little exercise of the three questions I mentioned earlier. But then be accountable and continue to say, we're moving forward. Are we seeing results? And if the needle's not moving, then be willing to change directions. And when we have that willingness to say, I'm going to strive to find where I can make the greatest impact and work collectively with others who are doing that, that's when we will see the shift that will ultimately bring an end to abortion in Maryland and throughout America. This is why I like David so much. This is, this is why David is my favorite person in the pro-life movement. Is, is this, this is, I think, the primary thing that you and I have in common. Is we're interested in trying to figure out what's working and what's not. This is really hard for people. It is really hard, the longer you've been doing a thing, pro-life activity X, to take a hard look and figure out, are you seeing good results from it? I just, a couple of weeks ago, met with a, a, a woman um, who does set up a counseling in Charlotte. Um, she's been doing it for three years. Uh, and I asked her, how many, how many babies do you know that have been saved? Because obviously you won't always know, but I, how, many, how many saved? She said one in three years. Now, I know enough about that group that there are better things. They, like, that there are ways they could be doing self-counseling a lot more effectively. So like, if you're at one after three years, it's probably a good sign that like, they, like my, Jacob on our team who did self-counseling, he's like, if you're not seeing one a month, you need to be asking huge questions kind of a thing. But that's hard because it's, it's like, then you've got to say, oh, we could have been doing something better earlier. But it is so important. This is like effectiveness is corporate buzzword bingo, but it really matters in this. This is life and death stuff. Um, and so, yes, I'd be asking those questions and figuring out how can you move the needle more? Because that needle it represents lives. Can I add one add on thought? So... When I stepped away from 40 Days for Life at the end of last year, and as God's been taking me on this journey of discernment myself of where I can find my next place of impact, uh, one of the things I've been really fortunate to be able to do is I've gotten to work with many of my heroes, a lot of the leaders of national pro-life organizations and, and people like we're connect, networking with today. And I just began an informal survey, and I'm not going to name any people or organizations, but these are people that you know their names, you know their organizations, 
I just started asking them, what is it that you and your organization are striving to accomplish? And some of them had, you know, they were able to quickly recite their mission statement or they were able to say something. And many of them revolved something around the, the idea of ending abortion or changing culture or something like that. But then I asked the next question. I said, what are you doing that demonstrates measurable results that you can see your progress towards that? And almost to a person, there was a long, awkward pause. Because a lot of times, even when we identify where we want to go, we know what we're trying to accomplish, then we have to step back and say, okay, if that's point B and we're at point A, what are the steps we're going to take to get there and then begin measuring as we go forward? And if we find out, if I'm going down the road and the mile markers are going the wrong direction, what do I need to do? I need to turn around and go the right way. But we, a lot of times, either fail to identify where we're going and or we really don't know what we need to do to move towards it. And today, I think you're being equipped on some of the things you can do to move towards it. But be that extra level of accountability to say, are we actually making the change that is moving our community, our state, and our nation closer to eradicating abortion and becoming a culture of life? What should pro-life advocates avoid and what hurts our cause the most? I think paying attention to the results. That we ought to be doing. So I think there are certain kinds. So if you're a sidewalk counseling, like there are a lot of different debates about what you ought to do and not not to do in front of an abortion clinic. Um, uh, and there's a lot of. I don't think it's going to be surprising if I admit there's a lot of infighting within the pro-life movement. There's a lot of d d d division. I know um, in the pro-life movement, and, and so there's a lot of different different topics that people butt heads on. Should we put graphic images on signs? Um, should we? Um, try to get people um, to become Christians before we try to get them to become pro-life or the other way around. How should we talk about birth control, capital punishment? There's like all these different things that are kind of hot topics in the pro-life movement. Um, and we've got thoughts about all those different things. But uh, I, I think, first of all, we, we want to try to preserve as much unity as possible. Um, David and I have talked a lot and I've learned a lot from David on how you deal with, you've got division in the movement, you've even got sometimes people attacking you. I've had pro-life people like publicly write articles against us before, it's weird. Um, and like how do you deal with that and, and what, what, what's like the wise kind of approach to that? Um, but I would say, so like for example, like um, instead of saying here's what not to do a, a, in front of a, a abortion clinic, I would just say like here's a principle. Um, if you're doing the kinds of things that are um, where you're trying your best but you're having the result of sometimes chasing women into the clinic, that's probably not the thing to do. That, that would be like, that seems fairly obvious. Um, and so just be thinking about what are the, what, what is the impact you're having on them? How do they interpret what you're doing? Like I think we, we all know our intentions. We have really, really good intentions. What is it like, it's, it's that like, Husband and wives all learn this in the first like two years of marriage. Like what you, like your radio antenna, what you're communicating isn't necessarily received accurately. There's like a, a miscommunication that can happen there because they're a different person. People are complicated. Um, and so trying to figure out not just, you know, how do I speak truth or do things that make me feel good, but how do I learn enough about how to get into pro-choice people's shoes? If they're an atheist and they're pro-choice and they voted for Hillary Clinton and all these things that are the opposite of a lot of the people in this room, how do they perceive things psychologically? So like, I'm just now learning about some research that Jordan Peterson has done about how he's, he's doing a lot of psychology research. And like, I barely know enough to even be talking about it in public, but just this, real, this one idea is like so fascinating to me and I need to learn more, is that he's finding of the, of there's that People on the left end of the, of the political spectrum and the right end tend to have different psychological, um, like personality, like things that are driving the personality. He said conservatives tend to be driven a lot more by disgust. Our disgust uh, meters, you know, if you think of inside out, you know, the, the purple one, the one who's always disgusted by broccoli. Like we have a lot of that and we tend to be very motivated by that. People on the left tend to be very, very motivated by compassion. Those are just different things. It doesn't mean conservatives aren't ever compassionate. It doesn't mean that they ever feel disgust. But at a general level, those are ways that we process differently. It just happens to be that a lot of times it falls onto that. You can, you, you, you can see that research um, drawn out. And so that means that we just a lot of times will think and process differently than the people that we're wanting to connect with. And we've got to be figuring out how are they perceiving what I'm doing? Are they perceiving what I'm doing as a loving act of someone that wants to help them? Or are they perceiving this as a crusader 
who is just yelling at them, yelling at them to make us feel good, or like says so something like that. How, do, how are they perceiving us? So I think there are two things that came to mind, and they kind of are two sides of the same coin. So for those who are not here, I think the thing which harms us is apathy. Yeah. And for those who are here, or those in the movement, I won't say specifically those who are here, I think it's the less than constructive approaches. So that could be times where we do our pro-life work out of anger and hostility. It could be where we fight amongst ourselves as opposed to fighting a common enemy, whatever. But the reason I say those are two sides of the same coin is I think they demonstrate anytime we take our eye off of the why, we will be wrongheaded in our approach. Analogy. If this building were on fire and there was a young child right near the door, you got out and there was a young child right near the door crying and didn't know how to get out, would you just say, not my problem, I'm out, and walk away? That apathy? I hope not. Or would you argue with the other people who got out about, well, what's the best approach to save that child? No, you would save the child, right? So anytime we let, whether it's apathy or we let these things that divide us and, and uh, the areas that are less than constructive hold us back, we are, by our inaction or action, saying it's not as important as we said it was. I have a good friend who's a former abortionist, Haywood Robinson, and one time he was venting to me about the pregnancy center that he was on the board of was being very, very timid on some things. And Haywood said, I told them at the board meeting, I used to tear the limbs off of these children. I used to end their lives. You are not recognizing how bad this really is. So when we're apathetic, or those who are not here are apathetic, we are not acknowledging how bad this is and what's really at stake, the why, that child, that mother. And when we let our differences divide us and hold us back from making constructive progress, we are no better than the people arguing in the parking lot about the best way to save the child while the child burns to death. So when we focus on the why and we give everything to meeting that immediate need right now, that's when we'll be able to overcome those things that I think are holding us back. Can I add one more thing? Of course. I've got, I'm sorry. I've, I'm not trying to dominate this whole thing. Um, but I've got this article that I'm working on. Um, and I don't know how long it's going to be before it's done. It's really hard to get it the way I want it to be. But, um, I'm talking about something, one thing that I wish every church in America would do about abortion, um, which is to create a culture, and I think you've got to be intentional about this, like the church leadership has to be intentional about this, but I want there to be a culture in every church where it is known that if someone gets pregnant out of wedlock, we are not going to shame her, we are going to love her, um, because there are a lot of Christians, girl, that could have been a cool moment. <laughs> Um, there are a lot of Christians who are uh, considering abortion or have abortions who know that they're killing a baby or they're hiring someone to kill a baby. And the reason they do it is because it is a much bigger deal when a Christian gets pregnant out of wedlock than when an atheist gets pregnant out of wedlock. Who cares? Um, but for the Christian, I, there are youth groups that kick students out for this because they're afraid of what happens. Like, is he going to have this negative impact on the rest of the youth group? Um, or even, you know, even in, in like in, in, in college clubs. And I'm not saying that we should act like there's nothing sinful about premarital sex or anything like that. I'm saying um, we have a culture um, where we know that it, it is not the state of being pregnant is not sinful. <laughs> Maybe how you got there is, but the state of having a child within you that is a baby, that is a child made in God's image, that is awesome. Okay, so we're going to love this person, we're going to do the baby showers, we're going to do all those cool things, the, the transitional things, all those things we're going to do. Um, we're going to come around this person, and it is known, like, if you're in the youth group and you mock her, like, it is going to be big trouble, um, because that is the kind of thing that, that kills babies um, in churches. But I think, like, that means pastors and youth pastors need to, like, move forward, because a lot of the women in the church, like, they're, like, some churches, they wouldn't do that anyway. Like, some churches would be fine, but if you don't say it ahead of time, 
but in people's minds, their fears might not be like they might not be accurate to what would happen, but they don't know. But if you got if you got like leaders in the church saying this is what will happen, this is what will be if this ever happens, we're gonna be really, really careful about this, then I think there would be fewer Christian abortions. I just learned recently one out of four women that attend church have had an abortion. And then four out of ten that come to church at least once. Four out of ten women. Every church I've ever spoken to, the first thing that happens is a woman will come up and say, I had an abortion, you're the first person I've told, and I don't know how to talk about it. And these are, like, I've never met them, I've never been to this church before, simple talk, and they've been in this church environment for years. And we're just holding back so much grace and hope and healing from them and here I am this complete stranger and they're fine opening up their darkest secret, the thing that's in their past, the thing that they haven't been able to receive uh, healing from and that's just so heartbreaking. Church is supposed to be the safest place to be able to come and confess and to share um, and we're just not creating that clearly. It's been years giving these talks and every single time I tell myself I almost don't want there to be a woman to come up to me after this talk and every single time that there, there is it is extremely heartbreaking. And then, of course, with your situation that you brought up, I think of Maddie Runkles, uh, the girl in Maryland, uh, in, a ca in a Christian school here in Maryland, uh, discriminated against. For those of you who followed the case, I don't know if any of you uh, heard Maddie Runkles' story, but um, she was, the short version is uh, it, um, that she, uh, obviously she got pregnant out of wedlock. Um, her and a number of other students broke the student code, but because of her pregnancy, uh, because she was visibly pregnant, uh, she was not allowed to walk at graduation. She had all of her leadership roles stripped away, and what a lot of people don't realize the background of the story is when, I, when we talk about like the shame that we're hearing in churches um, and that it is the administration or the youth pastors or, or the pastors who need to, from the top down, model this grace. Well, we didn't see that at her school, and it was the parents and the teachers who gave her the biggest uh, the biggest issues, the biggest um, just pushback. Um, the, a lot of the bullying came from other parents to her parents over Facebook. Um, in school, kids talking to her like, this is what my parent thinks about you. It was the adults that didn't get it. Uh, how heartbreaking is that? And she reached out via email to me just one night um, sharing her story, the longest email ever about what was going on with her in her school. It's like, Hey, honey, like you need to call me tomorrow. Um, and then I sat down and talked with her parents, and they just realized how much this is happening, like an <coughs> epidemic in Christian schools across the country. And I just thank Maddie for her bravery to be able to speak up and to share her story, because we've seen girls from all over the country speak up and say, me too, me too. And I had no idea how to talk about this, or yeah, the abortion feels easier to me. And I know it might not be later, but in this moment right now, while all these parents in this community and all these teachers are looking at me, somehow sacrificing my child seems easier. That's extremely problematic, and we're the ones who created that problem uh, as leaders of the church, as just people who attend church or attend, attend these schools or know people. Um, and it's our job to try to reverse that um, and support students like Maddie. One additional thought about abortion in the church, since we've kind of shifted into that direction for a moment. A few years ago, I had a profound experience in Fargo, North Dakota. The local pro-lifers had been very frustrated about the lack of pastoral involvement and church involvement in the pro-life issue. And so they put together a statewide pastor summit and they bribed the pastors, offered to pay their way and food and put them up in a nice hotel. And they got a fair number of pastors who'd never been involved in pro-life before to actually show up. And so it was a one-day event, and early in the day there was a lot of kind of defensive walls because they thought, oh, it's going to be the stereotypical pro-lifers, the people that I've been trying to avoid, the people who are trying to drag <laughs> me into all this rabble-rousing troublemaking. But towards the end of the day, they had a panel of post-abortion testimonies. And there were several, and they were very compelling, but the last one was a woman who had never shared her story before publicly. She had only recently gone through a healing retreat and found personal forgiveness in Jesus Christ for the sin of abortion. And all of us, we are all sinners. Let's just be transparent here. Um, but as she shared her testimony that day, she described how for the weeks leading up to her abortion, when she found out she was pregnant, she was sitting in the same spot in the same pew in her church. 
weighing this whole thing and trying to figure out what to do. She went and had the abortion. The week she was, had had the abortion, she came back and sat in the same seat in the same pew in her church. And for the 20 years after her abortion, she sat every Sunday in the same seat in the same pew in that church. And she described to these pastors, she said, for those 20 years, both the time leading up to my abortion and all the time since, I never heard a single message ever in my church about abortion. I never heard a message about healing and forgiveness related to abortion. She said, so I came to the conclusion that not only was this the unspeakable sin, as a result of it being unspeakable, it must therefore be the unforgivable sin. She said, for 20 years, I carried this burden on my heart because my pastor and my church failed to deal with this. She said to these pastors, so if you think you're doing somebody a service, if you think I want to be loving and not offend people, she said you are actually harming people by not helping people to realize there's hope, there's healing, and there's forgiveness. There was not a dry eye in those pastors, and many of them have gone on to become pro-life leaders in their state because they were convicted. So again, it goes back to the why. Sometimes we're afraid to do things without realizing true love offers hope and healing to those who've been wounded. And if we can share that message within our church, and if your pastor's not doing it, then you be the person in the church that's offering that hope and healing to those who've been affected. <clears throat> We're gonna um, change directions a little bit. Um, I'm gonna start asking more directed questions towards people. So Heather, you're first up. Okay. But sure. um, I think a lot of people in this room um, <clears throat> maybe have come here through like the Right to Life movement. Um, I know we do have some Catherine Foundation supporters in here, but um, could you paint a picture for us? What is access to abortion like in Southern Maryland? Where does a woman who is abortion-minded go to terminate a pregnancy and maybe touch a bit on um, how many of them might find themselves walking through the doors of the Catherine Foundation? or um, your cohorts in St. Mary's care at, and sort of paint a picture of what it's like to be in crisis in Southern Maryland. Access to abortion is extremely easy in Charles County. There, there is a Planned Parenthood, but they will refer you up to Annapolis, which is only, what, 30, 40 minutes from us. So there's a, an abortion clinic there, and across the street there is a pregnancy care center. So access is extremely easy. Um, getting an abortion is very easy. You don't even have to have parental signature at all to get an abortion in Maryland. Um, Sid is looking at me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was like, that was correct a week ago. So. <laughs> Hopefully that's still correct. Okay. Yeah, so you, yeah, which is to me unfathomable, but that's the way it is. And also in Maryland, you can have a full-term abortion in the state of Maryland. So that's where we're at as a state. So I hope that answers that first group of questions. Now the second, so I'm clear, is who's coming to us? Yeah, and how do they find you? Sure. So thankfully we have increased our reputation over the past few years as being a place where you can get a free pregnancy test and a free initial sonogram. You have to have that, that sonogram, that printout of your baby to get an abortion. So what has been amazing for us is that we have meta tags on our website. So if they're Googling abortion, we come up, not as an abortion clinic, but our name comes up, Catherine Foundation, with our website and our number. So we get multiple calls on a weekly basis of women who want to have the abortion. And we say, very honestly, we don't do abortions, nor do we refer. However, when you come to us, we'll give you that free initial sonogram. We'll confirm your pregnancy, first of all that pregnancy test and then we'll do that free initial sonogram. So when they come to our door, yes, we do all that that we are telling them we will do, but we also sit down with them. They won't leave without having a conversation with us, without us using our flip chart that says this is what happens when you have an abortion. We just want you to be aware because when you go into that clinic, they're not going to tell you. This is what happens when you take the abortion pill or when you have this type of an abortion, or this type of an abortion. So it's our mission to share the truth. As you said, that balance, tons of grace, tons of truth, tons of love in that conversation. And we see woman after woman change her mind. So we don't know. They may leave, they may have the abortion, they may leave, we may never hear from them again, they may choose life and we may not know it. But we are seeing a high number of women, tons of results um, with that approach. So I think, did I answer all the questions? Every single person here should have brochures for that POC in their glove compartment. Yes, you're 
Here we you go. We have brand new brochures. Get well, some of these. Yes. Do you have, well, a, do you have like hundreds of those here? We do. We yes. have a lot okay. right here. But I did want to mention one thing quickly that in the past oh, year. Sorry. Now I'm all No, you're doing No, that. it's fine. I'm just saying, like, do this. So, Come on. So we're opening up. We, we've decided God would like us to be the strongest. We know that he wants us to be the strongest presence for pregnancy care in Charles County and even beyond as he sees fit. So we're opening a new center in La Plata. Our open house is at the end of November, an additional center. And we have also opened a center in Nanjimoy. So we're now three locations and uh, we're just excited at how God's providing and blessing. And we've also started the abortion pill reversal. So there's only two places in the state of Maryland that will do that reversal and we are one of them. We partner with Dr. Michael Patterson and we've been able to save two babies through that abortion pill reversal. I wish I had pictures. They're beautiful babies, but it's been astounding, and we're so excited to continue that. Women have 72 hours after they take the pill to give the hotline a call, and if they're in the D.C. area, Maryland, D.C. area, and they want that abortion reversed, we'll be the people that they call, and we're so, so excited to continue to do that. So um, a little bit of a follow-up, and I'd like you to speak first, and then maybe David to follow up, um, you know, from his perspective of 40 Days for Life. But what does counseling um, a, an abortion-minded woman look like inside your center as opposed to possibly sidewalk um, counseling where you're actually, the woman's walking into the clinic and you've got a moment, you know, to kind of, so because people walking through your door, like you said, they, they are abortion minded, but you yes. have almost more of an intimate um, uh, perspective. So talk about what that looks like and maybe from your perspective, how that differs from sidewalk counseling and then David, you could jump in after. So honestly, I'll be very honest. I don't know a lot about sidewalk counseling because I am very busy in my lane. So I, I know that I have to give my best yes in my lane. And so hopefully one of you can speak on the sidewalk counseling. I can tell you what we do is that, and I've alluded to this before, we open arms with love and grace to the woman that comes through the door. We have a very nice counseling room, make sure it's decorated very warmly and beautifully. And they go and sit down one-on-one -on -one with a client advocate who most likely has been in their shoes. We have material that we use. We have pictures that we show. We share the gospel with every single person that comes in in a very loving way. We offer referrals, um, it, and it's unlimited amount of time. And we try to take the most amount of time that that client will spend with us. So the work that pregnancy help centers do across America is some of the most crucial work in our country. And I want to thank you, Heather, and others who have dedicated themselves. And frankly, if you were to look at the entire universe of the pro-life movement, Pregnancy Help Center aspect is our brightest shining spot yes. because that's where lives are saved and it's an incredibly thankless job and yet incredibly impactful. So with that said, when you are outside an abortion center and you have that fleeting moment and the abortion industry is wising up and they're making these facilities now even more inaccessible for sidewalk counseling where they'll put the parking lot around behind or they'll put up high gates and fences and walls and other things which for an industry that prides itself on proclaiming that it's for choice they try to preclude any option of any choice other than the one they're selling and making hundreds to thousands of dollars on so if we are there to try to reach that mother at that moment in time a couple of thoughts number one I would say pray for God to give you the grace and give you the words because again, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So many times it's purely through that move of the Holy Spirit that you're able to have that connection. Number two, you can't save the baby until you can reach the mother. Yes. And so until you can connect with that mother, the reason she's there is because she feels she has no choice, as Josh was referencing. All of society is pressuring her and she feels that this is just like the only escape route. And so as a result, you have to meet her where she's at, and you have to connect with her and her needs or her perceived needs at that moment in time to be able to ever save the baby. So a lot of times, you know, we, we, we can try to use approaches about, mom, your baby, and, and trying to, to tell her, and, and occasionally that will work, but more often it's, hey, you're in need, we can come alongside you and help you. So that's the second thing. And the third thing, and this is most important, is 
you're trying to get her away from that place to a place that can truly help her. Yep. So we're not trying outside an abortion facility to have as profound, deep, relational, transaction, transitional conversations because the opportunity is, is usually not there. You have a few seconds, maybe you get a minute if they come over to you, but the goal is to get them to the Catherine Foundation or to your nearest pregnancy help center because that's where they're going to receive the love, support, and help. Example of this. In Germantown, Maryland, Leroy Carhart came to town and uh, started doing late-term abortions. And when that happened, people began to pray in 40 Days for Life and other efforts outside of that. Eventually, some people realized we can't get onto the property of this office park where Carhartt's abortion facility is. And so they ended up opening a pregnancy center, renting space inside the office park, which then gave them access to this property. So the pregnancy center was across the street from Carhartt's facility. And so people would come out and pray and sidewalk council. So there was one morning where this mother, who the whole world was crushing in on her, she uh, was pregnant from a guy who had just got sent back to jail or her, her father was in jail. She had no money. She already had a child at home. She felt there was no other place to go. So she was there late in her pregnancy, scared, going to Carhartt's for a scheduled abortion appointment. She pulls up, she gets out of her car, and for whatever reason that moment, Grace, Holy Spirit, the abortion center opened a few minutes late. So the closed sign was still on the door and it wasn't yet open. So she glances around, and there's a couple of people there praying, and one of them says, can we help you? Magic words, can we help you, or can I help you? She says, well, and she describes her story and her situation. They said, well, there's a place right across the street here, free ultrasound, free services, you'll have to pay in here. And they just said, and we'll be happy to just come alongside you and help however we can. She went across the street, she walked into the pregnancy center, and the words she used to describe her experience, she said, I walked into an environment where I was surrounded by love. So she experienced that moment of help, that moment of grace. She walked across the street, went into the pregnancy center, surrounded by love and support. She carried her baby to term. She gave birth. And I got to meet that baby at a Germantown 40 Days for Life kickoff event. When she came over to me, she introduced me to herself and to her baby. I got to hold this little boy in my arms. His name is Jordan. Mom's name is Cherie. And he was alive because of that moment of grace, that little conversation on the sidewalk, and then having the access to a pregnancy help center like the Catherine Foundation. So if you get that magical combination all working together in every place where abortion rears its ugly head, that's how God can help us to save many more of these lives. Can I have one more thing to that? Really? Sorry, okay. <laughs> Just, um, there's a, a fantastic... There's a really good sidewalk counseling uh, program that Lauren Mazuka created called Sidewalk Advocates if you're interested in doing sidewalk counseling. We also, on our course, we had Jacob, who's on our staff, who does a lot of sidewalk counseling. He's been doing sidewalk counseling every Friday at the clinic near his house for years. Um, and so we recently figured out that he's been doing the same kind of R&D on that sidewalk that we do on college campuses and figuring out some new, really effective things to do there. So we're creating a whole new module. It'll be at least a couple hours long for the course. Hopefully it'll be out sometime next year on that. Um, and, and we'll do some things that are different than, than what Lauren is doing. But we, we're really good friends with, with, with Lauren and we love what she's doing. But I'll tell you, like, even now, right now, there are a couple of podcasts that were released as part of the course podcast that are just like Jacob talking about some of the things that he does. And we've had people email us saying, this was the best cyber counseling training we've ever had. It's just a couple of hours of audio. It's like not well produced or anything like that. Uh, or it's like, it's not fancy. Um, but Jacob has learned some gold um, uh, out there on the sidewalks of how, how, how do you love these people really well um, and save these lives. So if you're interested in doing some sidewalk counseling, um, there's some really good stuff there on the yeah, podcast. Yeah, I was going to plug that. I, I mean, obviously, I have the course myself, and I listen to the podcast every week that it comes out. But those, those are some of the best podcasts um, of the last year are the ones where Jacob um, talks about what he does. And I mean, it's truly gifted. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna shoot over here to Michelle, who, cause we really wanna know about the youth of today. Yeah. We wanna know what are some ways that we can, <laughs> we can get these high school students and college students, like how are they shaping the pro-life movement? That's number one. How are those who are active already shaping the movement? And then, you know, how do we get those youth involved? And why should there be a Students for Life Club in every high school? This <coughs> These are all my favorite questions. <laughs> Thank you for asking everything I've ever wanted to say. Uh, so first of all, <laughs> yes, <laughs> love it. Uh, so first of all, I just want to brag about our youth in this state.
state and just across the country. It's just crazy to me that Students for Life celebrated 10 years uh, a couple of months ago. And just to start from a handful of clubs and a student board, American Collegians for Life, and it is what it is today, and over 1,200 student groups across the country, and that there's just so many we can't keep up. And it used to be, you know, my job was a regional coordinator, and I would go out on campuses that didn't have a group, and I would spend my whole day with a clipboard talking to strangers about abortion, and this guy taught me how to do it. And that was my first experience <laughs> in D.C. I with remember you. that yes, day. He came day. in and taught the Students for Life staff, and I tell this every time I give an apologetics talk, that I, yeah, I'm going to try to take Josh's nine hours with me, and then a full day experience, and squash it down into 45 minutes for you, but by the course. Um, so, and that was my first experience with Josh, was go out on the streets of D.C. and talk to complete strangers about abortion. Okay! <laughs> um, and so I did that. And so I would do that my first year as a regional coordinator and go out on college campuses, my little clipboard. Hi, would you like to take a human rights survey? Do you remember the survey? Yeah, yeah uh -huh. I would do that all day, every day. It's changed this mm -hmm. since, but yeah. It's okay. Uh, that was four years ago. And so I, in an effort to find these pro-life people, and there were tons of them, and then that's how I would start clubs, but I would spend a whole day doing that. And now I feel like my email is just piled with students coming to me saying I want to start a club. People in this room who I can rattle off names of that you guys have all rallied together to start clubs. And I, I just, it's so many I can't keep up, which is a good problem to have, so keep them coming. Um, so just to see that growth exponentially and the impact that students are having that I'm not able to have. I don't go there. It's great to be able to visit. Uh, I'll be at Towson this next week. I'll be at St. John's Catholic Prep. I've got a full week scheduled of different schools that I'm going to with displays and conversations that we're going to have and a whole school assembly where I'm going to be able to share uh, to a whole audience. And although it's at a Catholic school, it's a very split pro-choice versus pro-life at this school. And I love these opportunities where I'm able to go in and teach, but but I don't go there. I might be inspirational or influential for that one day, but it's really about training and equipping our young people to get those daily conversations and to meet those fellow peers of theirs who are going through a crisis pregnancy situation. It's great to be able to have opportunities to network with all of you and all of those students. So, um, quick story of our national office is out of Fredericksburg, Virginia. But then our regional coordinators are located all across the country. So I'm in Sykesville, Maryland. It's just outside of Baltimore. And then we have another Virginia's coordinator. She actually lives in West Virginia. Um, and th about this time last year, we had someone from our national staff getting groceries. And however it comes up, I don't know. I've got this tattoo that people ask, what is this about? So I'll tell my grocery store person, oh, let them live. I'm you know, anti-abortion activist. I tell complete strangers all the time, and they regret asking me. Um, <laughs> So they're getting groceries and they explain, um, you know, what they do for a living and the person selling them the groceries or checking them out um, said, oh, my girlfriend actually just found out that she's pregnant. We have no idea what we're going to do. And his girlfriend went to George Mason University where we had a super active club and at the time, our, who is now our regional coordinator, but Lori Casillo uh, went to George Mason University. I was her regional coordinator, called her right away and said, oh my gosh, you need to look this girl up. We traded information. She drove this girl to a pregnancy resource center and connected with her throughout that school year. Lori now works for us and is the Virginia's regional coordinator. It's just amazing who knows who and to be able to plug them in and that's why we need a club at every school. Yeah. Because the same thing happened two years ago at University of Maryland. And I know that they have a great uh, pro-life ministry out of their Catholic center, but we have yet to get a strong Students for a Life, like a secular club, out of University of Maryland. And same situation happened where somebody talked to somebody, talked to somebody, and there was a woman in crisis pregnancy. Uh, she was going to go take the abortion pill, and um, somebody told me, like, hey, do we have a group at University of Maryland at College Park? Uh, because we know this girl, and if we could just get uh, someone from the club to, to pair up with her. And we tried everything that we could. I tried to work through the C, uh, CCM organization, I said, let's just flyer the campus guys with abortion pill reversal information. Like, we might not be able to get to her, but let's just make sure it's everywhere. And we had people scheduled to be outside of that Planned Parenthood facility at the time, like, hopefully ready to encounter her. Like, hey, is your name Sarah? That's not her name. Uh, but hey, is your name this? Um, and like, yeah, I'll go hold a sign, is your name Sarah? <laughs> if that's what it takes. Uh, but then we did get word from our friend of a friend of a friend that she ended up going through with the abortion, and she ended up taking the pill, and it completed its process. 
but I just keep thinking like how much more effective we would have been if we had that club for that student to plug into. So that's why having a group is so important. And if you are an adult in the room wondering what you can do, thinking, well, I'm not a student, I don't attend anywhere, and honestly, I've been tempted to go sign up for a class somewhere where we don't have a club and just start the club. Like, how much does a course at this university cost? <laughs> I just want a club at this university. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it'll take. Um, so you can do a lot. Uh, just people who you might know. Do you have friends with kids in school? Start talking to them about that. Make sure that they get those resources for how to start a group. Do you attend a church with a youth group? Because just bringing in a pro-life speaker, I've given so many talks at youth groups, and just from that one talk, seen four clubs start at public high schools, and where else would these groups have come from? I just spoke at a homeschool group that's starting out in Frederick, Maryland, and then they asked me, well, hey, do we have, uh, should we let other people <laughs> into our club? You know, we're homeschool students, should we let the others in? Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, you should, <laughs> you should let the others in. Uh, so they had public high school friends, yeah, because I've seen that work really well, that homeschool students can all get together and then invite their friends who go to public school and then influence them to go start the group at their public high school. I know, I'm trying. Um, so there's so much that can be done just by who you know. Um, and if you swear that you don't know anybody, you've got zero connections, um, if you want to sponsor the course for our students, because that's an amazing way to get our current student leaders plugged in to the best dialogue tips that they can have. If you want to sponsor uh, the travel of students to go to a leadership workshop, uh, we have a leadership workshop coming up at Catholic University of America, and we the tickets are $15, and sometimes that makes or breaks it for students. So if you want to sponsor a student to go to a leadership workshop or a national conference, come talk to me, because students don't have that thing called money. And if you want to be able to make sure that they attend these things and equip them to know what to go out and do, then that would be such a blessing to them. I, I, I want to wrap up the panel so we have time to take your questions. I want to ask one pointed question to Josh and then one last one for the whole group. So Josh, as a connoisseur of good arguments and gracious conversations, how can pro-lifers use Facebook and social media as a force for good? Oh man, <laughs> Facebook's a mess right now. <laughs> Um, uh, I think there are good things you can do. We're, we're working on a speech that we're going to be uh, giving at the Students for Life conference on social media tips. We're going to be doing a course podcast on this pretty soon. Um, so we're thinking about, we're like, all of our staff is independently working on our list so we can kind of merge them and make it a cool thing. But um, a couple of thoughts off the top of my head. So generally speaking, um, if you're changing people's minds on Facebook, it's because you are being gracious and winsome and making clear like one good point amidst a lot of common ground and a good source um, and uh, like when you're like uh, you want to be thinking about the lurkers the people who are just watching um, because those are the people that are more likely to change their mind it's not like the people like you've seen we've seen the 300 comment long threads of the you know eight people they're just like claws out and just like this is this whole thing so just like maybe one intelligent, reasonable comment in that, and then just kind of bow out, because if you, if the pro-life person is the most reasonable one there, that's awesome. I've got these articles on the, on the table out there about the, t me telling the story um, of Richard Dawkins tweeting this article that I wrote about him. There's all these pro-lifers that wrote this thing about this controversial thing that he said. Um, I was the only one that he retweeted on the, on the pro-life side, and all these pro-choice people ended up, like philosophy people, ended up on our blog. Like, I can't believe that the most reasonable person on this entire controversy was this pro-life Christian guy. Like, it's like really frustrated. But like, that's the impact you can have, is just by being reasonable. Um, but when you find that pro-choice person in the comments that you want to influence, you will not influence them in a public debate. Um, because there are multiple reasons why Facebook, I'm not saying Facebook's totally bad, um, but there are a couple things about Facebook that causes people to be less virtuous than they would otherwise be. Um, and part of that is, is the algorithm is basically created to give you confirmation bias. So you're only seeing stuff from the political views that you like, which is not good for intellectual virtue. But also, you're always thinking about branding. 
You're always thinking about how you look to other people. You're like, we're way too image conscious. And so when people are in a public debate, they don't, they're not, that's not that emotionally safe place where they're able to be authentic and actually reconsider their views. And so I'm finding that person and moving that into a one-on-one -on -one thing. I'm messaging that person saying, you said some really interesting things, but that whole thread's a mess. Can I ask you a few questions and get it one-on-one? -on -one? Get into email, get into Skype, or better yet, if they're local, go grab coffee. I want to buy you coffee. Let's talk. Because um, that's all crazy. Um, and so those are the kinds of things I'm thinking about is um, be reasonable, a lot of common ground. You've got to do a little bit of a caricature of yourself. Like me, like when I'm texting or when I'm writing on Facebook, it's, it's not exactly the way I sound when I'm talking in person. There's way more exclamation marks and emojis and you know, like you know, emoticons and things like that because when people are reading the text, they're filtering it. And so I, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about how they're filtering it when it's like so much of, of what communication is body language, right? You lose all the body language on Facebook. You have your words and your profile picture. That's it. You're an avatar to them. Um, and so to get through that, I have to create a little bit of a super common, groundy, nice guy caricature that seems like, if I read it out loud, feels a little bit like over the top, but like once it's filtered through, comes across something hopefully like realistic to like who I am uh, or like authentic to, to who I am. And so um, I just got to say like proof your comment. When you've written your thing, do not click enter. Wait, you need to reread it like twice. Once for clarity because like that's what like you, no one writes amazingly the first time. So you're proofing for clarity, you're adding some words or whatever to make it more clear what you're saying. But more importantly, you're proofing for tone. How are you coming across? Did it come across too snarky or too, maybe just kind of confrontational? Um, because once again, they're filtering it. So if you come across as aggressive, they're not gonna be able to take your view seriously. Like you're getting in your own way. You don't wanna get in your own way. Our message is offensive enough, don't add offense to it. Okay, so um, I wanna pick just one wrap up question and then we'll go to our open QA. Because we're, we're about like 18 minutes off schedule right now. That's fine. We're all having a good, everybody's having a good time, right? Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, which one? Okay. All right. So the last question is how do we build the pro life community, our community, locally, right here? One that is engaged and motivated toward action rather than just being pro life. Now, I know we've all sort of talked on that today, but some concrete. What can Charles County do? What can those of who came from Baltimore do? What can we do to build our pro-life community? Well, What's attention first? David. Take us home. David, David. You need to get a David B. right in your town, and then he will make it happen. We don't believe in cloning, remember? That's true. We do not believe in cloning. Yes. In all honesty, I think a lot of it is what I shared earlier during the talk is just understanding what each of us can do, but then also realizing that it's not just us alone and working with other people. There are parts of the pro-life movement that are not only not my strong suit, there are parts that I don't like, but that doesn't mean they're not important and that I don't need to collaborate with those who are in that facet. To give you an example, I hate some of the political stuff, hate it. This past primary season was just heartbreaking to me to see friends stabbing each other in the back during the presidential election and then even afterwards, and we had strong emotions, which many of us had, but the way they manifested themselves was heartbreaking to me. Yeah. But yet, we still need to be involved in public policy, whether we like it or not. And it may not be that you're the one to be running a lobbying group, but we still need to work with those who are, and some of you, maybe it is, to be involved in that facet. So I think it's, again, it's finding your place and getting in motion and joining arms and linking with those who are doing the other pieces and working together, keeping the why always in mind and moving towards the finish line and marking that progress as you go together. If you do that, you'll make progress. The other thing I'll just tell you, you could look at this room and say, well, let me, let me just ask a question. How many of you are from within a 15 minute drive of this specific parish. You live within 15 minutes. Okay, so we have people that have come a good ways. Why are there not more people here? Doesn't that sometimes question come up to you? Oh my goodness, where's everybody else? Where's everybody else from just within this parish? Where's everybody else from within the 15 minute radius? Let alone, where's everybody else from within Maryland? 
It doesn't take everybody. It takes you. It takes the people around you, each doing our part. And God fills in the gaps. So, yes, we're going to strive to continue to build our numbers. And in some ways, the numbers are growing across the pro-life movement. There are more people getting actively involved. And if you go to the March for Life in D.C., you see this. But the reality is, any time history has been changed, it's usually a small handful of people with great passion, determination, and they will never, ever give up. I'm going to recommend a book to you. And I actually wasn't planning to share this today, but it's a book a friend gave me. It was actually Kristen Hawkins from Students for Life gave me. And you're going to have to put a little bit of a filter on because of one aspect of this book. It's called Blueprint for Revolution. It's a yellow-covered book, and the guy who wrote it is a, was a Serbian activist. He was a student during the time that Slobodan Milosevic was the tyrant running Serbia. And anyway, having been in Croatia and having seen some of the, the terrible pain that was caused during the Balkan War, I was very connected to this. But this young man was part of the group that set out to topple this dictator, Milosevic, and they succeeded. And since then, he has worked with nonviolent revolutions all around the world to try to help them, in many cases, topple tyrannical dictators. But there are so many lessons in this book that apply to what we're trying to do. And the reality is that most of the things that have changed world history was not accomplished by massive numbers of people. It was accomplished by small groups of people. Yep. Sometimes they got massive numbers of people to raise their hand for a quick second. Great, any creative movement. But in reality, it's a small number of people that can shift the entire course of history. Now, the filter I'm going to tell you about that book, should you choose to get it on Amazon or read it, is the guy is not a Christian. He actually says that his gospel is the Lord of the Rings book. So I was like, okay, that's not so bad. I'm <laughs> moving in the right direction. It's talking. Um, but he does use examples of he feels that some of the progress of so-called same-sex marriage is a positive progress, and he uses that as an example. So you have to kind of take and understand that this is the filter he's coming into his perspective with. But there are so many lessons in there about humans moving the world and changing history and frankly I think we can learn from those who do things that we recognize as not virtuous even the abortion industry there are things they've done well to be able to cement something that's destroyed millions of children and, and yet somehow proclaim that this is a good thing and people believe it so we can learn from that but realize it doesn't take everybody it takes somebody and you're that somebody God called you here today God called you into whatever facet you're already involved in or that which he's laying out the roadmap before you to get involved because he wants you to do something that will save lives, that will impact hearts and minds, can impact eternal souls, and literally can help change the course of history. All right, and on to that. Um, to go, yeah. Um, I do the uncomfortable thing. Do, do, do something that's uncomfortable for you. This is not the most fun uh, activity to be a part of. It's just not. Um, and you've got to be okay with that. This is a marathon and not a sprint. So you're going to, so for, for you to really make a, a, a big difference, a lot of times the big difference stuff, you're just not going to be able to do from your living room. It's just not. So College Park, the College Park Clinic, where they're doing a lot of abortions, it's an hour from here. Um, so going back to David's analogy, if there was a kid in a burning building didn't know how to get out an hour from here, would you drive there to go and help him? Like, that's a bigger ask than if you're right in front of the building. I get that. That's the reality of the situation, um, is we need people willing to spend a couple hours just driving. You can be listening to pro-life stuff on the way, like, you know, the podcast, um, the podcast and the course. I know, I just talked talk about the course too much, now it just feels gross. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the course anymore. Um, but there's like, you can do those things, and it, I go to make a difference. Like, uh, if you can do several counseling, that's awesome. I'm not, like, I, I have totally agree with David. Get, figure out what your lane is. Not everybody should be a several counselor. Um, but even just praying, your presence there. Um, David told a story about someone, you know, not having an abortion just because there were people there willing to say, can we help you? Those four amazing words. Um, when we did that first uh, Fresno 40 Days campaign, um, there was a girl on the second day of the campaign who walked up. Um, it, we weren't doing several counseling. We didn't know how. Uh, but she just saw people holding open Bibles and reading scripture and praying, and she said, I'm not having my abortion today. You can make that difference even without, do, maybe a scary or doing self counseling, but just being there praying. But there's such a big difference between, you know, five to 15 people being there versus one or two. Um, and so having people there and just being willing to do something that's a little bit uncomfortable um, 
it really matters. There's, there's babies dying, so we're going to have to be willing to do uncomfortable things um, and, and do it with the right intentions and do it with love and grace and all of that that we've said. Um, but sometimes that means we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone. Um, and that's where uh, I think a lot of times God does the most amazing things is when you're out of your comfort zone. I just want to add something really cool that I kind of noticed about all of our stories. I don't know much about your story, but I'm going to... One, I'm going to open this, maybe it's true for you. Um, as I was sharing, or as David shared kind of my story, and I heard a little bit more about how you started, and you started them, um, it sounds like all of us had a person who listened to our crazy idea and then confirmed in us and said, go do it. Yeah. Like, go do it. And some of you, I think the wheels are turning and you've got your crazy idea and maybe you wrote it down or, or you're reflecting on, yeah, I could go do this. And if you're waiting at all for anybody to say, go do it, I think we've all affirmed. Go do it! Go do it! Go do your thing! Hi. Well, thanks for, thanks for all of you for coming today. Um, I've heard uh, a Yes. So a couple things off the top of my head. I'm sure you guys probably have some, some good thoughts on this too, but um, one thing is uh, they were a lot more united than our movement is. Um, I actually read a, a paper um, a while back that was put out by a group uh, where there were logos of all these different um, gay rights advocacy uh, groups on it, and they were talking about how they need to be able to work together. They need to agree on, like, we're gonna, like everyone's got their own ideas of what's the next best thing to do, but we're not going to fight each other. We're going to work, so here's, like, we're just going to kind of work together as a coalition, and we're going to work in this order, and they did, and they were a lot more effective um, as a result. Um, I think the Purchase Movement, frankly, it does that better too a lot of times. Like it is like Planned Parenthood does not agree with everything that all the other people say, but like they don't fight each other very much in public. Um, and so uh, I'm not saying like not, the issues that divide us sometimes, some of those are really important issues. Um, are you going to be more persuasive with a graphic sign or not? Like that's actually an important issue. It's not one that we should just like ignore, but we should I think have those conversations with grace and charity and assuming the best about each other. Um, and so that would be one. And then the other, like, sometimes it's frustrating how effective, I mean, the, the, what, what has happened in the last 20 years in America is pretty unique. Um, how much of a, of a public opinion shift there has been. Um, and so I think part of that is that the, the gay rights movement has been effective. But I think also, to be fair, they had a major advantage that we don't have, which is the media. Um, you've got you've got shows like Modern Family and, and, and other shows that had a really strong impact on the way people think um, about this issue. And so, like, I'm not giving up. It's just we have a lot harder battle to fight because we do not have that massive kind of um, opinion changing uh, arm uh, or, or, or Goliath on our side. A couple of thoughts, and I would again recommend that book because it does illustrate some of the lessons to learn, not only from that, but from other uh, movements. Blueprint for Revolution. I don't get a commission on Amazon for that. I don't even get a commission when I plug Josh's course. I was one of the first endorsers. I'm like, I love this. I can make that happen. I do. I can <laughs> make a commission. I need to sign up for that. We need to sign up. <laughs> sign you up. Here's, a, here's a few lessons I think we can take from it, though. If you go back and, and read the history of the early stages of what is the modern homosexual movement. Uh, there's actually documentation of some of the early meetings that charted the course of what we saw transpire over these last few decades. There's a book, if I remember, it's called After the Ball. Am I remembering the title of that correctly? Which was in the 70s, a group of uh, hardcore homosexual advocates got together and they mapped out their strategy. And it was documented in this book, Google After the Ball. You can find there's free versions of it online. And they followed it. They, they were a tiny minority of people, those who were advocating for that position at the time. So again, it doesn't take everybody. It takes a committed small number of people to change the culture. Number two is they built the whole case around an equal rights argument. If that doesn't affirm the importance of what Josh is doing, I don't know what does. So it's all built around equality. And you can look at all the ways that, that they've tried to do this. Love is love and all these other arguments that have been built around equality. 
And going back to what they did in the 70s, they were strategic. They had an objective to change the culture. They defined what they wanted it to look like, and then they mapped out the path of how to get there. And then they were vigilant at executing that which they had mapped out. If you look at that today, you say every one of these things happen. It's because they mapped it out and then they did it. So for us, we may be, we're a larger minority in terms of those who are dedicated to the pro-life movement. They're pro-life people, you could say, are a majority, but frankly, those who are willing to come and do things like we're doing today and what you're gonna to do tomorrow and the next day, we're a minority, but that's good enough. Next, we need to understand the importance of advocating equality and build our case around equality. That's going to reach the hearts and minds of the culture today. And third, we need to be strategic and we need to be vigilant. So those are the lessons that I would take away from it that we can apply to what we're doing. And when we do that, the good news is we've got truth and we've got God on our side. So ultimately, this movement shall prevail. Good. They don't think it's um, their place to speak out against abortion because they don't want to offend someone else or they don't want to make someone else feel uncomfortable. How do you get beyond that? Because there seems to be very strong movement in our country, not only with regard to abortion, but anything anymore. Yeah, so the, the phrase, I, am, I personally would not have an abortion, but I would not tell someone else um, uh, whether or not she should have an abortion. We hear that on campus so often. Our team has actually privately been calling this the standard pro-choice position. This is where most pro-choice people are at. Um, and so there's a couple of things that we're doing there. Is one, we're trying to affirm, like sometimes, um, there are, like even if it's uncomfortable to tell someone we don't think that you should have the right to do this thing, if we've got a good reason to think it's immoral, then it's like, like m most people um, agree that, that at least some laws are good. Like, I, I think a lot of people have some kind of libertarian tendencies where it's like maybe there's too many laws, um, the government should be smaller, things like that. But almost everybody agrees that there ought to be laws against harming people. Like we should have laws against murder and rape and assault and battery. Like almost everyone agrees that those, so there's a reason for that. It's because we want to protect innocent people from being harmed. And so a lot of times we're trying to find common ground and say like for us, because I, I, I've got this view, you might think this is kind of strange, but I've got this view where I think that a human embryo and a toddler are morally equal. I know that might sound crazy to you, but that's where I'm coming, that's why I'm pro-life, so I'm just pulling the curtain back, that's where I'm coming from. So because I think that, um, I actually think that babies are getting killed in abortions. And so just saying we need to let, we need to trust women to decide, like is it persuading me? Because I think maybe, like women might not all know what abortion is, but that, but that doesn't mean that abortion isn't killing. And so I need to be convinced that I'm wrong, that either abortion is not killing something, or maybe that a woman's bodily autonomy should trump the right of the child anyway. And there's some of the autonomy stuff kind of in your question, and that's too complicated for me to get into on this panel, um, but we've got a lot of thoughts about it. If you go into our blog and the archives under pro-life philosophy, we've got some stuff there, an entire module of the course. It's really, really important, I'm telling you. If you do not understand the strongest bodily autonomy arguments, this is where pro choice people are fundamentally coming from. This is the thing that is, matters the most to them, not that the inborn is not a person, it's this. Um, and I think so much of why we have not changed more minds about abortion is because we've been pretty good on talking about personhood and pretty bad about talking about bodily rights arguments. So responding not to the weak, lame, meme versions of bodily autonomy arguments, but the really strong arguments coming from people like Judith Jarvis Thompson and David Boone. And if you can get good at responding to those, I can't tell you how good of an impact that you can have on people. Equal rights. Um, you started off by saying that you don't approach it from a religious standpoint. And, and I'm struggling with um, stopping at the concept of equal rights because I think equal rights comes from a religious standpoint. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume that you encounter a lot of students at uh, universities that maybe don't believe in equal rights when you really, you know, they believe that a human is no different than an animal or, uh, or that maybe they, uh, they would save one person versus another person because of the uh, 
benefit that they might provide to society. How do you uh, how do you deal with that without getting into the religious aspect of that we're created in God's image, we're not uh, a product of evolution or something like that? Yeah. Oh, there's so much in there, um, and there's it's like a series of five amazing philosophical questions. Um, and so, there's a situation, this, was, this actually came up on a radio interview I did a couple of days ago where someone was asking a similar question like, if you're, if you're talking to atheists, um, if you cannot ground morality in atheism, like you're having moral arguments with them and, and not doing the biblical thing first, does that even work? And I think it's a really good question. It's a very understandable question. Um, almost all the atheists we talk to believe, whether they're right or wrong, that they can ground morality. Um, like, we're not talking to very many moral relativists anymore. Moral relativism, the, what is true for you but not for me, is dying a slow death right now. We don't talk to that many on college campuses. On the internet, some still, um, but not so much on college campuses. Like, almost, like, all but, I think, one philosopher now has abandoned it. Um, it's, it's even made fun of by atheist philosophers like Sam Harris. Um, and so, instead, we're talking to a lot of utilitarians. Um, who, who, people who are trying to ground an objective morality in something other than God. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a few different ways to try to make that work. I'm not saying it's successful, but this is the direction, like right now, the smartest minds in atheism, that's where they're at, is they're all objective moral thinkers trying, and they believe succeeding, I think failing, but they think succeeding, in grounding objective morality in something other than God. So what we're doing, like, we've tried, like, so, like, there, there's this amazing, uh, I don't know if anyone follows William Lane Craig, fantastic Christian apologist, maybe the smartest Christian mind in the country, he's, like, the best debater, and he's just, like, he's amazing. Um, and he teaches a bunch of different arguments for God's existence, and one of them is the moral argument for God's existence. He basically argues, like, you cannot have objective morality with God, we do have objective morality, therefore, there must be a God who created that thing. And I believe that argument's true. I think, it, I think all, the, all the conclusion follows from the premises. The problem is, in our experience of trying to t explain this to atheists, it's failed miserably. Atheists are not convinced by this. Whereas a lot of atheists are convinced by a, like a minimal facts case for the historical resurrection, for example. Where you, you, know, you basically say, like, all, like even the anti-Christian historians agree on these 12 facts about the resurrection and these 12 facts when you combine them together basically rule out all the other options besides the resurrection happened that's a very evidence-based approach that works really well um, with atheists and so we basically take an approach of just kind of conceding for the sake of argument in the beginning of the discussion that atheists can have morality um, and so we're sort of like we're kind of like a boxer tying our like a, a hand behind our back and still participating in the match and we can still win, it's fine. We're exchanging minds every time we go and do an outreach. Um, because we're, we're starting with this kind of area of common ground and working within their worldview, which we still can do. And then later, once we've built some rapport, and they're like, wow, these guys are like really smart and virtuous, which are the two things you want them figuring out about you. Um, then, because this makes a really powerful chord when you tie those two things together. Um, then, maybe you can have a conversation probably not the first time you meet, but maybe five meetings down the road, of whether or not they can successfully ground morality in something other than God or something like that. But I'm certainly not starting there. Um, as far as humans and animals, there's not that many students I meet who actually believe that humans and animals are equal. We get that sometimes, but usually they're just saying that because they don't want to lose an argument. Um, and so we, like, we'll, we'll, we'll do this thing sometimes, and we'll, we'll tell students about this. Uh, my brother's old roommate, uh, Jacob, had a, uh, he was a hunter, and so my brother describes like how like, Jacob one time went out, he uh, stalked a deer, um, shot it, and brought it home, skinned it, and, and ate it, and like they made sausage, and they had sausage the next morning from this deer. Um, and you tell it to like the extreme animal rights activists, it's like humans and animals are equal, and they're like, oh my gosh, and you're like, I know, right? And then you ask them, like, what do you think should happen to Jacob? And like, he should go to jail. He's, oh, he's evil. It's like, how, yeah, right? Yeah, how long should he go to jail for? It'll be like six months. Six months? You said humans and animals are equal. What if, what if he did that to a girl? I don't think you're following me. I'm going to spell this out. I'm sorry. Okay. If, what if Jacob stalked a girl, shot her, brought her home, skinned her, and made sausage out of her, and they ate her for breakfast the next morning? He should be in, in a Hannibal Lecter mask for the rest of his life talking to Jodie Foster. Like, it is not six months. He should be in jail. Like, clearly, 
there's a difference between humans and animals. And it's just a matter of helping people to see. But sometimes they're just biting bullets because they don't want to lose. And we have our first three podcasts. We thought it was going to be one turn to three on how to deal with bullet biters. I get this all the time, and I do that scenario all the time, and it works 99% of the time. University of Pittsburgh, I had one young man, like, take it to its ultimate conclusion and stood back and said, yeah, I'd eat human meat. Oh, and I slowly backed up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have never <laughs> abruptly ended a conversation as fast as I ended that one. That's the only time I have had hundreds of conversations where that works. Not this guy. Um, so there's always the one, but I don't think that'll happen to you. I don't think you'll meet that guy. <laughs> yeah. um, Josh, could you real, real quick, while Seth's moving over there to answer Sarah's question, could, uh, you mentioned utilitarianism, yeah. and maybe for people in the room who might not exactly know what that means, like, and you, you say you're seeing atheists trying to ground their morality. Like, could you just real quick, like a sound bite of what exactly a utilitarian argument is and how it might come up in an abortion conversation? Yeah, so utilitarianism is roughly the idea that what is objectively morally good is what it's going to do is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Um, so uh, utilitarianism, this is, this is where the, the, my Richard Dawkins article was coming from. Richard Dawkins cares about increasing pleasure at a some level and decreasing pain at a some level. Um, and uh, utilitarianism makes a lot more sense than relativism on its face, and it's taught in almost every TV show and movie. Like, you don't see a lot of relativism in TV shows. But every time Jack Bauer tortured someone on 24, it was for utilitarian reasons. Um, utilitarianism, every once in a while, gets right answers, but it's like, gets it, like, accidentally, the way a stopped clock gets, like, the time right twice a day. Like, it's not getting it because it's right. It just happens to be right every once in a while. Um, and it comes up in abortion conversations because a lot of times people will actually argue that, uh, like, they'll say, like, you know, we need abortion because people are poor. And usually that means, like, they're concerned about poverty, but they also think that the unborn is not a person. So we'll trot out a toddler, we'll do these different things to try to show them. But sometimes they'll be like, no, maybe poverty is so bad. The cycle of poverty is so bad that even if we have to kill a few toddlers to help entire families get out of poverty, that would be a good thing. That's probably a utilitarian. And you need to be able to recognize, like understand utilitarianism and recognize it, and then be able to respond to it in the chorus. <sighs> Doing it again. We teach a, a, a way to respond to utilitarianism. This kind of shows this is not the right worldview because it's gonna get wrong answers consistently. And if your moral worldview gets wrong answers, it shouldn't be your worldview anymore. Um, thank you guys so much for everything. I was um, really struck by a statistic that was shared. I think it was Heather who said one out of four women in church have had abortions. And it just made me feel that I wanted to share how can we effectively express that graphic imagery and um, very strongly worded signs uh, almost create a PTSD type of moment for a lot of women who have made a very difficult decision in their lives and would like to be involved in the pro-life movement, but just cannot abide by being in that presence. It's yes. just too profoundly hurtful. How do we overcome that obstacle and how do we effectively communicate a change? Well, first of all, I, I agree with you 100%. It is traumatic for someone who's had an abortion to see those types of signs and those types of posts on Facebook. So I know that us in this room, we can be more careful. You know, first of all, let's start with ourselves and let's be more careful about what we put out there. I've had to check myself when I go into churches and businesses and places that I'm called to speak about what I say. I even had to go back and apologize to a MOPS group because I didn't mention that we do abortion recovery in our center. I mentioned everything under the sun but the fact that we do abortion recovery. And I'm, I, I left and I'm, I'm texting the lady that's in charge. Can you please tell everyone we do abortion recovery? And if anyone in there has had an abortion, we would just love on them. And, you know, we have to start with us and understand that one in four women have had an abortion in the church. So that, that's probably, that statistic is probably even more so in, in other places. I don't know. Um, I got that statistic from a CareNet conference from our, the CEO of the CareNet umbrella that we're under. So start with yourself, start with your organization, the places that you work for, and just be aware that we always be thinking about the abortion vulnerable, or I'm sorry, the, the one who has had 
and abortion because they're everywhere you turn. And um, we have to be completely sent. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, first off, thank you for sharing and thank you for raising the issue. This is obviously one of those points of contention. There are different people in the pro-life movement who have very different viewpoints about the use of that as an educational means and, of course, many, many other things. Uh, I think a lot of this goes back to why we do what we do and then our how has to derive from why we do what we do. So if we are trying to be loving and merciful to everyone affected by abortion, we have to do our best to reach the person where they are. Uh, the first time I ever gave a pro-life talk in a church, I gave a kind of, let's go storm the gates of hell, you know, rip-roaring talk. <laughs> and afterwards, a woman came up, tears running down her face, and she ripped me up one side and down the other. And I was stunned because I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in the church. That's of course, you know, call people to action. <clears throat> and I went to the pastor afterwards, who was a good friend, and I said, what did I do? And he said, never forget, in every audience, there's somebody who's been affected by abortion. Yes. Always remember that. And always make sure to include a message of hope and healing yes. for that person. Yes. So with that said, let me, let me position this specifically for the question about graphic imagery. I'm going to give you two scenarios of where I've seen it done. Uh, one time, there was a person who called himself a sidewalk counselor who stood outside of the abortion facility in College Station, Texas, where we began 40 Days for Life, and he held a large image of a baby that has been named Malachi as a torn apart uh, baby in one of these graphic images and he used to yell at everybody going in that they were going to hell and he used to taunt the workers that were there at the facility and I watched women after there were uh, first off I watched women run into the abortion facility faster because of that image because they were trying to get away from this horrific thing and it propelled them into the place and they were dissociating because they were thinking about themselves at that moment because of this crisis from that image and instead were repelled by it so in that case, the man who was trying, I believe, to save lives was actually, it was detrimental in that case. Uh, the other thing is his disposition was certainly not one of love, at least from the way I perceived it. And as a result, I think it created more barriers and, and challenge and harm and polarized a lot of people who wanted to come out and pray at the abortion facility who didn't want to bring their kids or didn't want to go there because of the, just the toxicity of the way he approached this. Contrast that with, uh, we one time had a speaker at the organization I worked with uh, who came in and during his presentation he told the audience, I'm going to show you a video and this video is going to be very disturbing and I'm going to warn you in advance that this video is going to show uh, some graphic video footage of an abortion procedure. If you have gone through an abortion and have not found healing and are not prepared to see this, please divert your attention. And if for any reason you're not able to look at this, I just want to give you that warning in advance. But I think there are people here who do need to understand the gravity of what it is we're dealing with. I was, I was the director of the organization. I'm freaking out going, this is going to be, the whole thing's going to implode. Everybody's going to be upset. We just finished eating our cheesecake after dessert. This is going to be a disaster. But he did it very gracefully. He did it in a way that really set the stage, allowed those who had not found healing or were unable to, to face that to divert their attention, and he showed a very short clip. I was very traumatized just seeing this image, and I've not been through an abortion myself. I had afterwards my pastor come up to me, and he said, when he started going into that, I was ready to leave the room because I thought this is going to be terrible. He said, when I watched, though, I realized I needed to see that to understand just really how challenging and bad this is. So as with everything we do, there are ways that we can, and I'm not advocating for or against the use of graphic images. 40 Days for Life, we always were, we were attacked by people who were strong advocates of using graphic images because we didn't take a position in favor. We were attacked by those who were opposed to them universally because we didn't take a position against. But we also recognize, as we're talking about here today, different people, God is going to lead into different lanes and using different methodologies, but should, you use those types of images or should you be around somebody who uses them, I think it is an important point to talk to them about their disposition, the way they're used, and when and how, and, and the, the effects it can have. There are people who use the images who may not understand how much pain this causes to somebody who's been through this. 
and simply instead of like saying, you should never use those images, just being able to come alongside them and say, I just wanted to share my feelings, something this, this really was very painful for me and I wanted to share why. And many times that's how we start to build bridges rather than create greater divisions. So just like we talked about in the, the homosexual movement, we are going to have different approaches. There are approaches in the pro-life movement that I personally would not choose and sometimes I think, eh, that might be a little more counterproductive, mm -hmm. but at the same point, Let's have good intentions, let's strive to work with one another, and let's try to find that when we use various different methodologies, we do it in the most loving, graceful way we can, and try to create the most good and the least pain as we do that. Um, one of the things that whenever I go on to college campuses and I speak on bodily autonomy arguments, which is my favorite talk to do on a college campus because then you get pro-choice people to come to you, and they're expecting to hate my guts, and then like by the end they're like, that was so great! You made that pro-choice argument better than I can, that was great, it was really interesting. Like I love doing that. But the beginning of the talk is helping everybody to better understand these arguments, better understand the people that are making the arguments. So I want to take a moment before I explain what your eye does with graphic images is, um, help sort of uh, advocate a little bit for the, like, here's where the people who are doing it are coming from. Um, because there is, I, I am really good friends with some people who do full-time work with graphic images. I've done work in front of those images too. Um, so I spent, I, our, our, our staff has spent a lot of collective time both doing dialogue in front of graphic signs and without graphic signs. So we've seen a lot of both and been able to really compare and contrast those experiences. Um, but I'll, I do know, because I've had a lot of discussions with people about this particular topic, some of the people, at least some of the people who do the graphic picture work, actually do realize uh, that, is, that is traumatic for post-abortive people to see the signs. And, and just so you know, I'm not, I'm not saying this is my view, but what they would say if they were here getting a chance to speak at the table, um, is they would say that they're trying to save lives. And if they have to choose between saving lives and making some people upset, they, they feel like saving lives is more important. So there, there's a kind of a calculus that's going on for them. Um, and they all have stories of babies that have been saved as a result of this. And all, and all of our staff at ERI has all individually had experiences of seeing people change their minds about abortion because of graphic science. I talked to this one woman for an hour and 15 minutes. I thought I was completely wasting my time. I'd gone through all the philosophy, all the science, and it's just like, it's just like not, nothing's happening. And then finally, like, I, 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 I didn't know what else to say. And she didn't leave. So finally, you know, we were working with a, with a group called Justice for All. They had this kind of uh, brochure that has some graphic images. And I just said, could I give you a tour through their entire brochure so you can see what they're saying? And she said, sure. And I did. And the last picture, and I warned her, um, she knew it was going to be graphic. And then at the last picture, it was a late-term abortion picture. She said, oh, I didn't know abortion was that harsh. I guess I wouldn't have an abortion now. So we've all had experiences where like all the, I tried all the stuff and this like so clearly there's for this person, so different people change their minds because of different things. We think of these things as different tools. Different people need different like different screwdrivers and things like that. And there are absolutely some people where the only thing it seems like will change their mind is a graphic image. We do have a brochure that has a whole fetal development kind of, uh, you know, a bunch of different fetal development pictures that we use a lot. And then we also have a middle page that has some first trimester abortion pictures. And we have a last page that has a very gruesome late term abortion picture. And uh, our rule is we will not show those pictures without getting their consent first. Um, and so we will ask, you know, we don't do this with every person, but we'll sometimes ask, um, could I show you a picture of what, we're, of what we're talking about? If they don't consent, we don't show them. Um, because what we found is when you get their consent, all of the, like, first of all, if you've got a post-abortive person that would be traumatized, they're going to say no. So you, you, you avoid that. We don't want to traumatize people. Um, but then also, like, a lot of times people's reactions to the graphic signs is one of anger at the people who put up the signs and not at the thing that's being displayed, which I think is morally confused. And so when you get their consent, all of that goes away. They are not angry at you. They're just, like, processing the images. Um, and so for us... It keep on coming back to every conversation is a series of difficult judgment calls and this prayer without ceasing. People are complicated, people are different. And so we're trying to figure out in every conversation, how do, how, how do I best help this person? And sometimes that means asking the permission to show them a graphic image and sometimes it doesn't. And we're just doing our best to work with the Holy Spirit and make good judgment calls for those people. We have an article on our blog called Abortion Images, a case for disagreement without division um, that I think is really, really good. 
um, and talks about here are some of the things that come in ground here, are the things that we agree on, and this is why we do our approach. Um, and it's a little bit different than a lot of other people's approach, but um, it's been working really, really well for us.